uh, my father and mother uh, met in an interracial housing co-op in Washington, D.C. We must remember that Washington, D.C. was in the South at the time, and it was a bastion or a center point of racial segregation in 1952. They fell in love that year in 1952, married in a black university called Howard University, where my paternal grandfather was the dean of theology, and then they moved the day after they married to Canada, as it was pretty well impossible at the time for a black man and a white woman to be living together as a married couple in the south of the United States. Uh, my father, as Anna mentioned, had been a, a soldier in the highly segregated American army in World War II, and his experiences there left him to decide to leave the United States forever. As a black American, he was good enough to die for his country at war, but not good enough to live in peacetime on equal footing with white people. My mother, Donna Mayhill, came from a very Republican, which means very right-wing, uh, sort of the opposite meaning that you have here in Spain, came from a very Republican white family in Oak Park, a suburb of Chicago. And some of the members of her own family left her or disowned her forever when she announced that she was going to marry a black man. So my parents were immigrants to Canada, American immigrants to Canada, and I can assure you that there's great skepticism among immigrant communities in Canada about the value of the arts. It's fine to go see a movie or to enjoy a sculpture or to listen to some beautiful music at a symphony, but one should never, if one is a child of immigrants, become an artist. That's just too much. Um, uh, my mother, nourishing the skepticism of the arts, and worrying that it was not a valid pursuit for a child of immigrants to Canada, kept a note posted on her refrigerator door, a note quoting the American novelist Philip Roth. And that note that stayed for years on my mother's refrigerator door said, when a writer is born into a family, that family is finished. Um, so I have many connections to uh, Spain. I, I first came here at the age of 17 when I was still in high school. I won a scholarship, so I used all my scholarship money to come to Spain for the summer at, at 17. And, and then I came again uh, two years later. I took a year off university to come to Spain to write uh, for, for many months. And then, and then at the age of uh, 28, which was more than half a lifetime ago for me, I started worrying that I was getting too old and that I should do something about it before it was too late. So I quit my job as a newspaper reporter in Ottawa, Canada, and moved to Spain to see if I could truly become the novelist that I wanted to be. So I lived in Salamanca and in San Luca de Barrameda and in Santiago de Compostela for about 15 months. This is back in 1985-86, where I committed for the first time to a life of writing. So I feel a great debt to Spain because it was here in Spain and including here in Salamanca where I truly became on a daily basis uh, a writer. To begin this short lecture, I'd like to draw some parallels, strange as this might seem, between Spain and Canada. What I find similar in both countries is a reluctance or a hesitance to fully acknowledge the presence and the history of people of African heritage and the patterns of forced migration. In Spain, although you can visit the Alhambra or Moorish castles in other cities such as Cordoba, the presence of language, culture, architecture, and education of African peoples ruling the Iberian Peninsula for some 800 years is often forgotten or underplayed. In your own art and literature and language, the contributions of Africans and of Jewish peoples in your history is, are sometimes neglected in favor of celebrating notions of the reconquest, the reconquista. Of course, Moorish and Jewish peoples were not the only ones forced from Spain in the medieval times of the Catholic monarchs. Exodus is a much more contemporary feature of Spanish life too. This year, as I know from living here this winter with my wife Miranda, this year marks the 80th anniversary of the end of the Spanish Civil War. My wife and I marked the occasion by going to see the original work of Guernica by Pablo Picasso the other day in a museum in Madrid. 
and we were reminded of the horrors of the bombing of urban civilians in this very country. We've been spending the winter here, so I frequently read your newspapers, such as El País, and I've read of the many thousands of Republicans, men, women, and children, who were forced to leave Spain at the end of the Spanish Civil War and lived in what can only be described as concentration camps in France. I see that in Spain this year, there have been many efforts to commemorate the people who had to leave Spain, some forever, at the end of the Civil War. These are painful stories, but they bear remembering because we must not repeat the errors of our past. In Canada, too, there are many errors and blemishes and wrongdoings in our own history. I will speak about black history in Canada and about slavery and refugee issues in a moment, and that's one of the central preoccupations of my writing. But it bears repeating that in the same year that you and Spain are remembering the long-lasting destructive effects of the Spanish Civil War and of the exodus that followed, we in Canada are remembering the abduction of hundreds of thousands of indigenous Canadians, First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people in the period between the late 1800s and the 1970s. Children were forcibly removed en masse from their own families and forced to attend residential schools in locations far, far away from their homes. In these schools, and I use schools between quotations, there was a systematic effort to remove these children from their heritage, to break their cultural, linguistic, and family ties and to treat them as second-class citizens in Canada. Many of these children were emotionally, physically, and sexually abused, often by the priests and nuns and others in charge of their education. The residential school system caused havoc, pain, and destruction among generations of Indigenous Canadians. And although the Canadian government formally apologized for this in 2008, and although more than $1 billion have been paid out to more than 100,000 residential school survivors in Canada, we have not yet fully recognized or acknowledged the hatred, the racism, and the destruction that we meted out to these people. Since many of you are studying Canadian literature, I'd like to recommend that you take some time to discover some of the many Indigenous writers in Canada. I could not do justice to the full spectrum of Indigenous writers in Canada, but I'd like to take, take a minute to name just a few of them. Carly Baker, Daniel Heath Justice, Carol Rose Daniels, Maria Campbell, Lee Maracle, Chelsea Vowell, Thompson Highway, Rita Joe, Richard Van Camp, Tanya Talega, Katharina Vermet, Eden Robinson, Sherry Dimeline, Drew Hayden Taylor, Thomas King, Mary Clements, <coughs> Richard Wagamese. And since I'm naming, which falls very much within the African in the African Canadian literary tradition, I'd also like to name just a few of the other black writers in Canada. Perhaps one day you'll have a chance to read their works or meet them in person. Dion Brand, George Eliot Clark, Karina Vernon, Austin Clark, Ronaldo Walcott. Essie Adujan, David Cheriandi, Lillian Allian, Andrea Alexis, Wade Compton, and Afua Cooper. My own works as a writer have focused more on the black Canadian experience, which is my own heritage. But in my current work, The Midnight Men, I'm exploring intersections between black and indigenous communities in Canada. The Highway, as Professor Fraile mentioned, is a novel about 5,000 African-American soldiers in the American Army in the early years of World War II who came up to northern Canada to build a long highway, a 3,000 kilometer highway over the tundra, the permafrost, mountains and rivers, a highway connecting the United States to Alaska. This highway was built to fend off or to anticipate an invasion which never happened, an invasion that was feared by the Japanese. After they bombed Pearl Harbor in Hawaii in 1941, the Americans feared that the Japanese would invade Alaska on the northwest coast of North America and then attack the rest of America. So this highway in northern Canada, crossing over indigenous lands, was built by African, largely built by African American soldiers from the Deep South who came up to build this highway in temperatures as cold as minus 40 and minus 50 degrees Celsius in the winter. My own interests um, 
involve exploring issues of identity and belonging, documenting notions of blood that define our collective and individual identities, giving those who are nameless a name and those who have no voice a voice. I use drama, fiction, to stimulate interest in black history, contemporary social issues, notions of diaspora, issues related to immigration, refugees, and belonging. In Canada to this day, we still know far too little about black history in our own country. And as Anna mentioned, this is Black History Month. Some of us in Canada would like to change it from February. Why for Black History Month did we choose the shortest and the coldest month of the year? That seems wrong. So perhaps one day Black History Month will be July or August. Um, but I'm also interested, as the title of my talk goes, in, in thinking about disturbing and really nightmarish connections between the transatlantic slave trade and modern day refugees. Um, and I'd like to draw a few parallels between the two, between people who are held as slaves and people who are contemporary refugees. In both cases, slavery, contemporary refugees, we have the forced separation of mothers and children. We have forced relocation of large numbers of people. We have segregation, for example, plantation life, uh, in which thousands of millions of African Americans and others in the Caribbean and South America, Central America were kept enslaved versus refugee camps today all over the world. We have in both cases, transatlantic slaves and modern day refugees, we have rampant sexual abuse of women. We have the demonization of slaves and of refugees. We have politicians and other powerful people expanding their power by demonizing slaves and refugees and building and appealing to anxiety, fear, and xenophobia in general populations. In both cases, slaves, refugees, we have diminished human rights and legal rights for slaves and refugees who live in their transplanted environments as second-class citizens. In many cases, sending fugitive slaves or refugees back to their place of origin could lead to their torture or death. In both cases, we have the powerful and the privileged doing their best to insulate themselves from interactions with slaves and refugees, except on their own terms and when it benefits them. The language of demonization and dehumanization is eerily similar in terms of pejorative references, negative references to enslaved peoples and to migrants. We have the absurd and insulting references to notions of blood quantitatively, blood quantum we call it in English, quantitative assessments of blood in order to attempt black people by their supposed blood quantities. Some of these ancient and insulting terms that are still very prevalent in the English language are terms such as mulatto, quadroon, and octoroon. But there would be just three among thousands of such terms still quite present in the English language. And we also have terms such as illegal and alien used as nouns to describe unwanted refugees. Finally, there is a huge social and political divide between those who wanted to perpetuate slavery and those who fought to abolish it, a struggle which was partly responsible for the American Civil War. And likewise, there's also a growing, almost unbridgeable gap between those who would demonize refugees and do everything possible to build walls to keep them out, and those who believe it is part of their moral international duty to welcome refugees and assist them in gaining a foothold in their new lands. And I should, welcome, I should mention that um, Canada has an unusual uh, political arrangement. I believe it's the only country or one of the only countries in the world that allows private individuals to sponsor refugees and to bring those refugees sponsored privately to Canada. And indeed, Miranda and some friends, with me helping a little bit, um, arranged to bring, in cooperation with the federal government, a family of seven refugees from Syria to Hamilton, the city we live in near Toronto, a few years ago. And we are just one of thousands of Canadians who've, who've come together, pooled their financial resources, their logistical resources to bring 
refugees to Canada and to make that journey easier and to assist their integration into Canada once they arrive. And, and I'd like to tell Canadians that, yes, it's, I think it's a moral imperative to realize that we live in a global community and to reach out and do this, but it's also to our financial and economic advantage. And I'd like to tell Canadians that um, uh, today's refugee is tomorrow's high school mathematics teacher, is tomorrow's cabinet minister in a federal government, is tomorrow's engineer, is tomorrow's heart surgeon. And so there is definitely a profound social and economic and educational benefit that we derive from bringing refugees to Canada as well. Coming back to some of the themes of my work, um, I'm interested in dramatizing black history as you'll see in reading uh, the Book of Negroes. So I should mention to you that as Anna mentioned, uh, black people have been in Canada for as long as they've been in the United States. The first documented black person in Canada uh, was uh, a translator for a French explorer living in what we call Nouvelle France or the east coast of Canada around 1603, 1605. The first documented slave in Canada was a young boy named Olivier Lejeune, who was eight years old. He'd come from Madagascar, which is a bit unusual. Most people stolen from Africa and stolen into slavery in Canada or the United States or other countries in the Americas. Most such people came from West Africa. But Olivier Lejeune, our first documented slave, came from East Africa, Madagascar. He was eight years old, and he was a property, the slave of a Catholic priest in Quebec City in 1628. So that's our first documented slave in Canada. Slavery was abolished in most of the British Empire on August 1st, 1834. So that date, uh, abolition, is a, a, the Emancipation Day, we call it, is a day that we still celebrate in black communities in many parts of Canada, celebrating the end of slavery in much of the British Empire. Whereas, um, Climactic conditions, heat, sun, allowed for plantation life in the United States and in the Caribbean uh, and other places. In Canada, we did not have uh, plantations with slaves, not because of any moral superiority, but simply because we didn't have the climate to have uh, plantations growing rice and tobacco and cotton and indigo and other such cash crops as we call them. So in Canada, slavery was primarily an urban phenomenon taking place in cities such as Toronto and Montreal and Halifax. I'd like to mention that we're not speaking only about historical issues. Anti-black racism remains a fact of life in Canada today. Unarmed black youth are shot today still by police officers in Canada. There's a disproportionately high number of black offenders in prisons. A disproportionately high number of black students are expelled from school. There are lower academic expectations for black youth in schools in Canada. And there are higher rates of unemployment and underemployment. I, I'll mention just uh, quickly that um, Given the preponderance of people of black and indigenous origin in prisons in Canada, I've decided as a university professor to start teaching a, a course, a creative writing course in a federal penitentiary, in a federal prison in Canada. And I've asked my university to do so and they've just given me permission. So as of the fall of this year, I start teaching one creative writing course in a federal penitentiary for women in a city called Kitchener. It's a small city of a few hundred thousand people, about two hours or so northwest of Toronto. And uh, it's, a, it's a course that I'll actually teach with ordinary university students who are registered to take uh, university classes. And they will come with me on a bus once a week into the prison. And 10 regular university students will travel into this prison with me once a week and take a course alongside 10 inmates, 10 federal prisoners, women, in a women's penitentiary, and we will study together. So I think we'll be doing a lot of learning together this fall in teaching this creative writing course. I'm quite excited by that possibility and look forward to seeing what happens. Inmates in Canada are not allowed to have access to the internet. So if they're going to take a university course and they're in, in locked in a federal penitentiary, you have to take the course to them, which is exactly what I'll be doing in, in the fall. Uh, for those of you who are interested in black literature, um, I would encourage you to consider 
uh, the notion of the slave narrative and the earliest forms of black writing that are produced in the world, in Canada, in the United States, in the Caribbean, uh, in Europe, are the slave narratives that come from people such as Frederick Douglass, Mary Prince, Olado Equiano, and Harriet Jacobs. They are just a few of the hundreds of people who wrote autobiographical narratives of their lives. The slave narrative is an immediate form of, of, of writing that just reaches out and grabs you by the throat. Whether it's written by, by a person with professional writing expertise, just such as, say, Frederick Douglass, whose, whose narrative is absolutely brilliant in its writing quality, or the, whether it's written by somebody with only a basic grasp of how to write in English. They're very powerful, emotionally engaging narratives. And I chose to write the Book of Negroes as if it were a slave narrative, standing in the tradition of the slave narrative. They're all narrated in the first person. They all begin by saying, this is my name. This is how I came to be born. This is how I lost my parents. This is how my parents were, were killed. This is how I came to be separated from them. And I'm going to tell you my story, dear reader, to assert my equality to you as a human being. So the slave narrative is an act of resistance and it's a fundamental uh, element of a literature that defines black writing, in, certainly in, in the Americas. As you'll know from looking at the Book of Negroes, uh, the Book of Negroes is about a segment of people who are known as the black loyalists. The black loyalists were people who moved all around the world in the 1700s. They were migrants without seeking to be so. In the first instance, they were enslaved in Africa and taken and sold into slavery in the Americas. Then, during the um, American Revolutionary War, when, uh, when America was still basically a British colony, and the colonies started to rebel and seek their freedom from, from, from the UK, um, the British tried to stymie or stop this American Revolution, so they promised freedom to any African slaves who had helped them fight the American rebels in the American Revolutionary War. So thousands of black people who'd been enslaved in what later became the United States came up to New York City. Keep in mind that Manhattan is an island. So they came to the island of Manhattan in the, late, in the 1780s to help the British fight uh, fight against the rebels who were seeking to create and who did create the United States of America. Men, women, and children came by the thousands to settle in New York City, in Manhattan, in the 1780s. They came in every capacity imaginable. They came as spies, soldiers, cooks, road builders, sex workers, prostitutes, uh, midwives, they came in every capacity imaginable to prove their usefulness to the British forces because the British had promised them freedom if they served the British during the war. But the British lost the war. So how are they to offer freedom to those thousands who came to serve them during the war? When the British lost the war and the Americans won their revolutionary war in 1783, uh, the British rewarded the African peoples who'd helped them in the war by bringing them to other British colonies. A few actually went to Germany, and a few went to the United Kingdom. One or two went to Jamaica. A few went to Quebec City. But the overwhelming majority of the, of the 3,000 black loyalists who served the British in Manhattan during the Revolutionary War came to Canada. It was a nine-day trip by ship from Manhattan to Nova Scotia, and they came to Nova Scotia and they settled. And although, as I mentioned, black people have been in Nova Scotia and in Canada since uh, 1603, 1605, the arrival of the black loyalists, 3,000 people in the short window of six months, constituted the first massive wave of black people in Canada. So that's 1783. And I chose to dramatize this little known aspect of Canadian history by writing a novel in the voice of Aminata Diallo, my protagonist. And I think I'll finish my lecture before opening up to questions by just reading uh, a, a small segment or two from uh, the Book of Negroes. I know that some of you are reading it, but I thought you might like to hear the voice that I imagine of the woman who's telling her life story, Aminata Diallo. Aminata, of course, is a very common Muslim name, and I've traveled and lived as a volunteer in various West African countries, and Aminata 
is as common a name as Juana in Spain or Mary in Canada. Um, and it's also the, name, the middle name of my eldest uh, daughter. So I named my character after my daughter. Um, it was very hard to get into the voice of a girl and a woman who's telling her story as an African person and, and a slave and then a freed person in the Americas in the 1700s. It's very difficult to get that voice, but I worked and worked and worked until I felt satisfied. And, and in this little segment, which is just uh, a couple paragraphs, I'm just gonna read the sound of the voice I imagined is Aminata, who's just entering puberty, just becoming an adolescent. She's about 12 years old and she's arriving half dead on the shores of America after surviving the crossing in the Atlantic Ocean. And the only word that you really need to know in order to follow the meaning of this very short excerpt is tubabu, which is the word in her language, as she does not yet speak English, it's a word in her language for, for white people. We were brought to an island just off the coast of the Tubabu's land. There were about 100 of us left. We were all placed inside a square barricade. Tubabu stood as sentries at the gate and patrolled inside with clubs and fire sticks. But mostly, we were left alone to wonder what would now become of us. It seemed to me that we traveled to the other side of the sun. On this side of the world, the sun was worn out and not to be trusted. My fingers grew thick and numb every night and throbbed every day as the sun climbed the sky. My ears were cold. My nose was cold. Like the others, I'd been given a rough cloth barely long enough to wrap around my backside. I shivered at night on the sandy earth, and one morning I awoke to find smoke trickling from my mouth. I thought that my face had caught fire. I thought that someone had bedeviled me during the night or branded my tongue. I waited for the burning. I prepared to scream. I held my breath. No smoke. I breathed. Smoke again. It came from within me. No burning. Just smoke. The smoke in my breath continued until the sun began to climb the sky and then I noticed that others too had smoked mouths in the morning. So that's just a short excerpt from the Book of Negroes. And um, rather than talking on too long, I thought I'd open it up to a few questions. And if you do have a question, I'll do my very best to answer it. My question maybe is a very personal one. I would like to know um, what do you think about, I mean, when you hear about the Libya nowadays is one of the uh, biggest slave markets in the world. What's your opinion and your vision when it is about to talk about it? I mean, thank thank you. you. The question is really about contemporary slavery. You mentioned Libya, and actually that's a very good question. Uh, thank you for that. Sometimes when I go to schools in North America, whether it's the United States or Canada, I sometimes speak to children or adolescents in school about my own work. And um, there's a little resistance occasionally if I'm talking about slavery. And some educators, some teachers, some children, some parents don't want to hear me talking about slavery or talking about the history of slavery in Canada, don't want to hear me discussing this, don't want to think that I'm writing about it because they say it's painful. It makes our children feel bad and it's, it has nothing to do with us because that was hundreds of years ago, this is today. Why are we even talking about slavery? So I appreciate your question because one of my answers to them is that yes, it's true that the transatlantic slave trade has ended, but other forms of social injustice and social inequity continue, including contemporary slavery. And experts about modern day slavery in the UK and in Canada and the United States, those experts estimate that as many as 30 million people today are held in states of slavery around the world, even in Canada. Occasionally, if you read the newspapers every day, once a year, you'll discover a story on the front page of the newspapers in Canada about a slave ring or a small group of people perpetuating a system of slavery within Canada. 
Often, these are women and girls who've been forced into sexual slavery uh, uh, around the world. And so it's a phenomenon, not just, of course, in Libya, but affecting countries, including many of the richest countries in the world. So it's a very grave problem. And uh, I guess it feeds into my argument that we must confront inequality and injustice in our own time. And so I reject the argument that we shouldn't talk about slavery because it makes our children uncomfortable. I would say that sometimes we have to face uncomfortable truths and the reality of our past and acknowledge the links between the past and today. And so your question is very valid because as I mentioned, there are said to be as many as 30 million people, including many girls and women kept in states of slavery today in the world. Oh, here's a question right here. Thank you. Thank you so much for your talk. And thank you for coming back to us again. Uh, my question is uh, what people in Canada think when they hear the President of the United States and his supporters chant, build the wall, build the wall, build the wall, and so on and so forth. And does it have any effect at all on the U.S.-Canadian wall or border when you people hear that? How do the, thank you for the question. The question is, what do Canadians think and feel when we hear the President of the United States clamoring to build a wall or having his people clamor? You didn't say this, but it's the same mentality, clamoring lock her up in reference to Hillary Clinton. I, I mean, the answer is painful because I think the answer really depends on which Canadian you're speaking about. It must be said, as much as it pains me to say so, that there is an emerging right wing, you know, extreme right wing in Canada too. Canada is not immune from trends around the world, whether it's uh, Italy or France or Spain or Canada or the United States or so many other countries that show uh, a, a, a strong and trenchant appeal to xenophobia and hatred today. Many political leaders, including some in Canada, ride on a wave of, of fear and hatred toward the ideas of refugees in the world today. And so the, the response among Canadians really depends on the type of Canadian you're speaking about. There is a strong segment of, of the population in Canada that feels very much that we have as I feel, an obligation to reach out to and facilitate the movement of refugees into the Canada, that we have room for more, and that our society benefits from the presence of refugees coming into the country. Indeed, the last federal election in Canada was partly decided uh, as a result of that issue. And that's very rare. In Canada, very rarely are national elections decided on issues relating to refugees. But that issue did play in to the emergence of a new government a few years ago in Canada that indeed preached or argued for a much more open policy in terms of r welcoming refugees to the country. So really, the reaction to um, not just Donald Trump, but all the people who elected him and who support him varies. It really depends on the kind of Canadian you're, you're speaking of. Hi. Um, well, from the story, you can read that uh, Minata Diallo. That have moves in her face. But I've been talking with many people who have different interpretations about that move. And I wonder if you could explain us what are, who are they? Thank you. I believe your question is what are those half moons on Aminata's face and why are they there? Well, thank you for the question. Um, I have not traveled to West Africa since I was a young man. But when I was a young man in 1979 and in 1981 and in 1989, I, I, I went to travel as a volunteer working for many months in three West African countries. I went to live in Niger, not Nigeria, but Niger, in Cameroon and in Mali. And in these countries at this time, and in other West African countries at the time, it was very, very common to see people, especially from rural areas, but not only from rural areas, 
wearing little marks on their, on their faces. In, in French, as I was going to French-speaking countries, we, we call them cicatrices, or, but basically markings on their faces, usually up around their cheekbones, ident identifying them by their ethnic you know, uh, origins. And so at the time, it was very common. I don't know if it's as common today as it was when I was traveling as a volunteer in West Africa in the 1970s and 80s, but it was very common then. And all sorts of different markings on the face depending on your ethnicity. And it's important to recall that these were marks that were considered beauty marks. They weren't something to be ashamed of, they were something to be proud of because the marking on your face signaled your own ethnicity and a pride of place and a pride of belonging. So when I was um, coming up with the story for Aminata, I thought, well, what kind of marking will I give her in, in, in something that she should be proud of and carry with her with a sense of pride? And I decided to give her the half moon. Um, it was not a facial marking that I saw when I was living in West Africa, but it was something that spoke to my imagination, so I put it on her face. And then um, when I was negotiating with the publisher about the cover, um, they, you know, they started to hire our graphic artist to design the cover of the book. And I started going back and forth with them about the face. And they'd show me an image that they were proposing for the cover. And I'd say, no, move it up. No, move it up. No, move it up. A little smaller, a little rounder. And we went back and forth 10 times until they finally had the marking on her face that I thought seemed right for my imagination. So the half moon on Aminata's face is a figure of my imagination. But it does reflect a tradition certainly that was very prevalent in West Africa when I was working there as a volunteer uh, when I was a young man. And dating back, of course, for hundreds of years. I see a hand in the very back there, and there's also one over here. Thank you. Thank you for the question. The question is, why did I choose to um, tell the story from that of a female protagonist? Um, well, I, I wanted to I wanted to go to a place where I felt the story most deeply, and um, I wanted I mean I taught to be a person who would lose her own children as a result of the transatlantic slave trade. Because of course, if you're the property of another person, if you're a slave in Canada or the United States, then you don't even own your own children. And uh, maybe you own your dreams, and that's about it. But you don't own even your own children. And so the separation of mothers and children was rampant and happened all the time. The separation of families happened all the time in, in the history of slavery. in Canada and the United States and other countries. And so I wanted Aminata to be a person who would lose her own children to the vagaries of slavery, but would, who, go, who would go on being a midwife, catching babies, as I say playfully, you know, being a midwife to other women who, who are delivering their own children, having their own babies. And she would face that pain. I suppose I could have written a story about a boy or a man, but I, I, it was a woman who appeared to me and um, I, I felt that uh, I wanted to inhabit the shoes of a person who had the most to lose. And sometimes in fiction, that's a good approach to take. If you're devising a character, who has the most to lose? And that's a good person in which to situate a story. So I went with the woman who appeared to me and I started to imagine a woman standing on one of the ships, leaving Halifax, in 1792 and sailing back to Africa. And I didn't mention this in my introductory re remarks, but although Canada received these refugees who came from the United States at the end of the American Revolution, they were so badly treated in Canada that after they stayed for 10 years, many of them left 
voluntarily and took ships from Halifax in the east coast of Canada back to Africa to create the colony of Freetown in West Africa. 1,200 men, women, and children left Halifax, Canada in 15 ships on January 15, 1792. And I started to imagine a woman on one of those ships, a black woman, about to sail from Canada to Africa, wondering, what's her name? How does she walk? What does her voice sound like? What's her history? Does she have parents? Does she have children? Does she have a lover? Who is this woman? And that woman became Aminata Diallo in my imagination. I did also see a hand somewhere around here. Yes, we met earlier. Hello. Um, going back to the topic of modern uh, slavery, I wanted to ask your opinion and raise the issue of um, um, something that was uh, very commented on last year, which was um, the forced labor that uh, some prisons in the United States um, uh, force upon their inmates, uh, taking into account that the um, overwhelming, uh, an overwhelming majority of the inmates in the United States are black people or racialized people. Can we consider this a modern form of slavery too? Yes, it's a great question. And the question is, can we consider modern day incarceration and people who are kept incarcerated uh, today, you know, in the United States, can we con consider this a form of slavery? Well, absolutely. Many people argue that it is an extension of slavery. We must remember that even after slavery was abolished in the United States in 1865, many, many people were forced into labor um, after the slavery ended to perpetuate forced labor, and many of those people were prisoners. Uh, yes, absolutely, prisoners today are forced into situations of labor. They're also deprived of the vote. And so if you've committed a certain crime and you've been judged, you've been convicted for that crime in the United States, you lose the vote forever. So there's an astonishingly high percentage of African Americans who no longer have the right to vote in their own country as a result of previous criminal convictions. So yes, uh, speaking loosely and thinking about the evils of today against the evils of yesterday, yes, I think that you could consider modern day incarceration uh, a form of contemporary slavery for sure. I, I agree with that analysis. Anna, how are we doing for time? question and maybe I'm using this <laughs> again. Um, a question for you. In one of my groups, um, uh, after a couple of weeks of teaching, the question came up about literature. What is literature, right? You are writing historical novels, neo-slave narratives such as uh, the, the Book of Negroes, also other sorts of novels. Um, but as a creative writing uh, professor, too, what is it that literature uh, provides you with and the readers that other sorts of writing does not provide? Thank you. What, what does literature provide us that other forms of writing, perhaps essays or journalism or academic writing, does not provide us? Um, that's actually a question I've had a chance to think about a little bit, so thank you for it. I think that literature, and I'm speaking as, as an atheist, but still I think that literature has a very similar place in our soul to that of religion. Literature offers us narrative and story. Literature offers us hope in times of despair. Literature offers us a path to dream of something better. Literature gives us a reason to get up and to dream of something better in our lives, in the lives of our children or grandchildren, even if it's not going to happen in our lives tomorrow. Uh, literature provides a narrative, and we all know how profoundly attached we are, children included, to narrative. If you're telling a story to a child, a story in a book, a little novel, a little made-up work of imagination, and you change one word in that story when you're reading to the child. The child will stop you instantly and say, no, that's not the word. That's not how the story goes. A child who's attentive 
to the beauties of literature already knows at the age of four or five or six exactly how a story should go, what exactly the words are, what the order of the words is, and those, that order is not to be violated in the eyes of this young child. So if you're a playful parent and you're playing with the words and changing them, the child will stop you immediately. And I think that speaks to the profound place that the making of story has for us. And the more our lives are troubled, the more we need narrative and story. In the same sorts of ways that people turn to religion, we turn to story as a, as a form of salvation. Also, if you survive something horrible in your life today, or if it happened to your mother or your grandmother or your great-great-grandmother, even though you can't change the horrible thing that happened, the telling of that event, the recounting of it, is a form of salvation. To tell, to survive an atrocity and to tell your story is a form of emotional salvation. And so I think that's what literature does for us today. Thank you.